Hello, everybody, and welcome to Madden Benz Unfiltered. Tim Benz and Mark Madden with you. Mark back from England. We're brought to you by Rush to Crush Cancer and the Rush to Crush Cancer bike ride. Details on that as we roll on here on the live stream today. Mark, welcome back. Certainly a lot has happened since you left, not just for Liverpool. While you're out there, they won two games. Good for you. You got to see that. Now you come back to Pittsburgh, and suddenly the Penguins are in the playoff race again. How the hell did this happen? I, I don't know how it happened with the Penguins. Uh, I think this is more a tribute to how bad the Eastern Conference is and the Flyers falling apart. Although the Islanders have had a bit of a resurgence. The Flyers have now lost seven straight, but the Islanders have won four straight. Teams like the Red Wings have kind of hung around. But uh, bottom line, like I said, it's not a good conference. And it's been left laying for the uh, third place spot in the Metro, the second wild card in the whole conference. And the Penguins may or may not reap the benefit of that. If I had to bet right now, I'd say they don't make it. But I'd rather hear what Sidney Crosby's answer is. Because he's carried them this far. Maybe he can drag them over the line. And if he does, that won't be his greatest accomplishment as a player. It'll be right up there, though, because... This is a very subpar team. It doesn't feel like a playoff-worthy team the way they performed all year, and this does feel like a last great gasp out of them to maybe get in, but I tend to be on your side of the fence in this, Mark, for as well as they played, even against some quality opposition of late. The five teams that they have left, all still pretty good teams, the most important of which the games against Detroit and New York, obviously. It's not just about winning. It's about winning without going to overtime and not having loser points given away. Well, yeah, the loser point is why this race is close, too. Uh, look at the Islanders, who are in double digits in loser points. But right, that's, yeah. that's the path that the league has chosen and I think they're going to expand the playoff even more, maybe as early as next year. And I know there will be some criticism of that. If it happens, it will you know, dilute the regular season even further. But, Tim, you tell me. It's a question I'm going to pose on my radio show later today. Tell me a league that's expanded the playoffs and regretted it. Tell me a league that hasn't got more money, more TV time that they could sell, more everything based on expanding the playoffs. Every league has done it, and every league has benefited. What so the NHL think, needs to do is start their season in September so it doesn't run through June. Yeah, that's it's getting long enough as it is. How do you think they do it then? Would they do it like the NBA and kind of do the 7-10 play-in thing to get to eight teams for a bracket? I hope so, uh, because you can't let the teams, you know, that, that wouldn't play in whatever the first round is sit around too long. That's unfair to them. Uh, I would do the exact way the NBA does it because I think that one game elimination right off the bat really gets people interested in the playoffs. I much preferred the MLB wild card round when there were just two wild cards and it went right into single elimination that four versus five game. Yeah, and I know this is a bit arbitrary. It's cyclical. It could happen any way, anyhow, any year. But like, for instance, even this year, um, whoever is the 10 seed doesn't deserve a chance to play against one of the top two seeds like Tampa does. Like Tampa has clearly been worlds better than whoever's going to scrape. Oh, yeah, in but that, that's too bad for them if they would get sucked into that, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten thing like the NBA does. Yes. You know, you don't want sucked into that, finish sixth, do better, just too bad. So you're saying draw a harder line. What you're asking for is a harder line between the third slot in the divisions and whoever the wild card is. Like give more of a reward for being in the top three. What I'm saying is anybody who's better than the lower part of the playoff pack that mm -hmm. gets sucked into that, you, you could always find that exception to the rule. You can always find that reason to complain. Who cares? You don't want to play in the in the first round, finish higher. Since we talked, Mark, we taped up the podcast yesterday evening. Uh, the Capitals lost to Ottawa. They got a point in overtime, but they lost. So given some of the way that, to your earlier point, the Eastern Conference has um, buoyed the Penguins, it's sort of like a lo lowering tide sinks all boats as opposed to a rising tide raises all boats. And maybe the, maybe the Penguins survive kind of like the Steelers did with the way teams lost to get them in. Well, are, are you insinuating the Penguins could win a series? No, I don't think. I think there is a pretty good line between the Rangers and the top two teams in the Atlantic and everybody else. 
yeah, I think there's a pretty good line between Florida and everybody else. But that said, Florida's that much better than everybody in the East, more so than New York, more so than Boston. They're the one team that would wipe out the Penguins in a playoff series. Four straight. It would be eight wasted days. That said, that matchup, if the Penguins do make it, seems very unlikely. Right, yeah. If the Penguins played the Rangers, the Rangers would for sure win, but it would go probably six. If they played Carolina, Carolina would for sure win, but it would probably go six. If they crossed over, got the second wild card, they would play maybe Boston. Boston's so weak at center, that would be the best matchup for the Penguins. But again, Boston would probably win in six. All right, Penguins fans want to hear from you. Again, I'm Madden Benz Unfiltered, brought to you by Rush to Crush Cancer. More than a ride, it's a mission. Join us May 19th for the Rush to Crush Cancer bike ride. To register, go to rushtocrushcancer.org and help us in the fight against cancer. Join the ride. Regarding the goaltending, Mark, can Nadelkovich keep this up all year? Or as we talked about in the podcast, does Jari have to get in there at some point? I'd start him tonight at Toronto. And if they don't, I understand it because Ned, you know, has started eight straight and not lost the game yet in regulation. But Ned showed signs of fatigue in that third period against Tampa. He regrouped at the end to make a couple big saves. But I don't think Ned can play the rest of the games consecutively. So I would go with Jari tonight at Toronto. I tend to agree in the sense that, you know, while you don't want to break up the streak, at the same time, you also don't want a blow-up start from a goaltender. And I'm wondering if that may happen in Dedelkovic soon. You mentioned fatigue, Mark. It's not just perhaps throughout the run. Maybe he's coming to the end of his hot streak. It's also within games. Like, he starts off games really well. And maybe this has to go with how the Penguins play. They're still not great when it comes to time and situation, score and situation. But he's been fabulous early in games, keeping them close, like in the New Jersey contest, and then they caught up, or helping them stretch a lead. But then, like in Tampa, my gosh, look at how things went in the third, and Look at, you know, the Colorado, although Jari was a part of that in the uh, Columbus games. I think overanalyzing. You know, we say stuff like, well, the Penguins start off games poorly. The Penguins aren't very good on the power play. And the Penguins aren't very good. They're not a good hockey team. They're not a playoff caliber hockey team. But then again, there's only six or seven tops, legit playoff caliber hockey teams in the Eastern Conference. So somebody else got to make it. Somebody else got to fill out those last one or two spots. Uh, but they're not a good team. They have maybe three legitimate top six forwards. Their defense is porous. They blow leads constantly. Yes. They can't play 60 minutes. They're just not a good hockey team. And making the playoffs won't mean they're a good hockey team. It'll just mean that Sidney Crosby is incredible still and that Evgeny Malkin woke up at the right time. What about Carlson, too? Is he woken up? He's better than the previous version of Suck, so I guess so, yeah. He's okay. Uh, on his performance, what's the more true statement? They're playing better in part because of him, or he's playing better because he feel less, feels like the games finally matter? I'm not sure he's playing that much better, and who's he to decide when the games finally matter? All right. I mean, Plus, I, guys I never won a thing. Never won a thing. Never come close. Never been to a final. Given that... They aren't that great of a team then. Once we get to the offseason, do they still consider trying to find a place to move him and or Jari? Yeah, I would. But, I mean, who knows what they'll decide. They're a team, as long as they have Crosby, permanently caught betwixt and between. Permanently. That go for Sullivan, too? Or do we kind of take the pressure off of Sullivan after a lot of it's been heaped on him over the course of the second half of this season? A lot of the flaws I just described the Penguins having – have certainly not been improved by coaching. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. I mean, I've been not bashful at all about saying I think the time to move on from Sullivan happened a long time ago. And uh, at this point, they're, they're just being married for the sake of being married, I think. No question. I mean, it. he's the coach. that They've just decided he's the coach, and that's it. And, yeah. you know, look with it. I am. Same thing with the football team, which we could get to later. How about the baseball team, Mark, starting 8 of 10 to begin the season? It's got, I got the impression that the podcast, you don't think this feels all that much different than 20 and 9 last year. 20 and 8, Tim. I keep having to correct you. No, it's, yeah, but it was 20 and 9 after March and April. That's 20 and 8 was the it. start. Come on, be optimistic. Don't be a hater. <laughs> but yeah, it feels the same as last year. I don't think they're a very good baseball team still. But, you know, people always say, why can't you just enjoy it? 
To which I reply, no, why can't you just enjoy it? Because I don't care. I've been beat down by no playoff win since 1979. I've been beat down by a payroll that's always in the bottom five. I've been beat down by starts like this that collapse under reality over a long season. So if you want to get excited, you feel free. Yeah, I think one thing that we're noticing now, I'm going to write about this in the Trib, is you know a lot of people are really happy about the lineup being lengthened and Telez has added something and Michael A. Taylor has added something. But it all comes down to, is Cruz going to be able to stay healthy and productive, channel everything he's got, and Hayes and Reynolds? Like the, the star players, their highest paid players, have to be the stars. To be Well, you talk about the lineup being lengthened. I mean, Michael A. Taylor, how much does he really help at bat? Yeah, so about the Pirates being back and whether or not their uh, lineup is going to be, I, I think, bolstered by the depth that they keep talking about of the star players that they have, what they perceive to be star players. You know, Cruz, I think, is the real deal. I don't know how much more they ever get from Hayes and Reynolds. I think they could be better than last year. Is that good enough? It might be good enough to get to the wild card. Uh, but the wild card, really, Mark, you only need 84 wins, 85 wins to contend for a wild card. Like we talked about with the expansion of the playoffs. I They're think they could get 84 five more wins. Huh? They're not going to win 84 games. I could, No, I don't think they'll win 84. I think they can get to 81. I think that that's my number. I had them right at 500. Yeah, I and we'll celebrate 500 like it's winning the World Series. Probably, well, maybe not. But, I, I don't know. know about you, Tim. I, I thought the crowds were disappointing this weekend. What about you? What's that? I thought the crowds were disappointing. What about you? After opening day. Yeah, I mean, especially after the carryover from opening day, you would have hoped that they would have drawn more, especially with the enthusiasm coming off of it. But, um, you know, I, I think opening day is a pop for them, and then they're gonna, there's going to have to be a buy-in factor. I think a lot of people think like you do. It's not just a matter of, hey, getting off to a good start. i got to be sold on something. You, you get the, hey, it's a nice night at the ballpark crowd out there. Well, it's not necessarily a nice night until it turns above 50 or 60. Right, right. That, like, they'll get bigger crowds when the weather dictates, but that – that isn't an excuse in a baseball town. And I keep getting told what a great baseball town this is. And evidence points overwhelmingly that it's not. No, it's following a winner at this point, And they haven't had enough winners to really dictate that it's a great baseball town. It's got a history, but I don't think it's carried through. Um, basically, well, because the history they had so doesn't matter. Losing. The history is ancient history. The history is dead history. It doesn't matter anymore. When you haven't won a playoff series since 1979, you've lost your right to cite history. Did you see the thing that came out, Mark, moving to the Steelers here about Tyler Huntley, how they might have had an interest in him? That made me wonder exactly what, where that window allegedly took place between when Russell Wilson was signed and when they ended up trading Kenny Pickett. That had to be a pretty small window if they were actually Why would I care him? that they were interested in Tyler Huntley? That's inventing a story that would have been meaningless had it actually played out. He's a bum. Why do I care about that? I don't know how much are you sold on fields maybe being part of their future. Because I'm just they, tired I, of talking about the quarterback. Okay? Mm -hmm. Russell Wilson's going to start. Justin Fields is the backup. He may or may not inherit the job. Everything else is ancillary. If you want to talk about the quarterback position, talk about how C.J. Stroud was the right pick and he's totally transformed Houston and Kenny Pickett was the wrong pick and he's made the Steelers kick that can down the road to an old guy and a, another guy who screwed up with the team that drafted him in the first round. How much variance have you seen from what's happened in the AFC this offseason? Like, do you see much movement from the playoff teams that were last year to this year? I, I, I got to be honest, Tim. What I liked best about Liverpool was I didn't think one second about the Steelers the AFC. Not one. It's not that time of year. And over there, it was easy to get away from. So I mean, not, not to be rude, but next topic. I, I Right now, I don't care at all. Did you care about the women's Final Four? That seemed to have a lot of people talking. No. no. But I will talk about that because uh, I, I think the most interesting thing about the women's Final Four is obviously it gave the sport a big boost. A lot of people watched it. I mean, record TV. I, I didn't see. Do you know what the number was for the final yet, Tim? No, I didn't see the number on the final. I saw the number on the UConn. It was the UConn game. It was like 14.2 million, which, yeah, is, which is incredible. Line. But here's the thing. Can they maintain it? Will women's basketball still draw that kind of audience without Caitlin Clark next year? Will there be a new flavor of the month to step up that's accepted as a phenom like Caitlin Clark was? The WNBA. Will they see a rise in eyes on the product? Live attendance, TV. 
Will the buzz go up because Caitlin Clark's there? Is that possible with her playing in Indianapolis? Not exactly the best market to help the whole league. So I, I think that this could be just a perfect storm type of thing, but I don't believe the buzz will continue. No, I think what the uh, WNBA needed to do was get Caitlin Clark to New York by hook or by crook. Not that that would have been a guarantee, but that would have been the best bet. And I, I've seen so far, Tim, that a lot – Oh, a guy says soccer talk. Bye. Yeah, see you later. See you later. In fact, Tim, whatever you don't want to talk about, make a list of what you don't want me to talk about. I'll talk about that specifically every week. Okay? Anyway, the uh, the WNBA players, they've said some things about Caitlin Clark that I don't necessarily find to be promoting her. No. There seems to be, there seems to be gatekeeping going on there among the WNBA players. I've been told she's not a lock to make the Olympic team and certainly won't start. But how can she start, given the buzz, given her quality? But but there's going to be gatekeeping going on all over the place with Caitlin Clark with the factor that dare not speak its name definitely involved. And we'll see what happens. Well, Mark, you know, I there seems to be a disconnect between the WNBA and the NBA. And by the way, we can talk about this from a Pittsburgh perspective too, with that SEA thing that went out, you, you got it. You got the survey you said, right? Because I think what it comes I down did. to, I voted no on everything, <laughs> but you bypassed the soccer ones. You told me, right? I didn't see soccer some... ones on my preview on my survey, Tim. Oh, you didn't. I got, see, I got soccer ones. There were some soccer questions in there. Would you support a team in this league or that league? I didn't really care. I don't, I don't know all the leagues that they brought up. I, I, well, the, the, the river Hans are in the USL, which is the, uh, second tier league, the triple a league. So, uh, I don't think Pittsburgh could handle anything above that. Well, you know, I, I, I think they have a nice stadium in terms of size for that level of play. They draw decent crowds. I mean, but MLS, I mean, are you going to draw that much to get, you know, soccer in? I don't think so. What I was noticing. Major League you know, Soccer. As, as you were talking about the WNBA thing, there seems to be a disconnect in so far as the college game is generating more interest on the women's side. And meanwhile, on the men's side, you know, like Danny Hurley had his screed that he had on uh, when he was talking with, uh, pardon my take, I guess is where he was making the comments. It was somewhere on ESPN about how he thought UConn was being undercovered. And if they played in Kansas or Kentucky or Duke, they'd be the biggest story in the country. I don't think he understands that he doesn't have the UConn job in 1994. He's got it in 2024. And the college game for the men isn't as big of a deal as it used to be. It's certainly not as big of a deal as the well, NBA. I think he's just trying to put his own program over, and I get that. Uh, but yeah, I, if you're saying he's being unrealistic, I agree. Um, it's not even so much about being unrealistic. It's just being, he doesn't have a grasp on where the game is in terms of its popularity. It's not as popular as it used to be. Well, he doesn't have a grasp that, that all the transfer portal and the NIL and the free movement and the coaching movement has ruined it. Okay. Uh, but, but the thing is though, if that many people are watching, is it really ruined? Is it really broken? I, I don't know. I mean, I tend to judge stuff by whether or not I watch it. Mm -hmm. And I used to watch college football all the time. Now I never watch it. When I say never, I mean never. You're going to okay, watch now, it. Now I used to watch college basketball, the tournament. I didn't watch one tournament game all the way through all year. I didn't watch one women's tournament game all the way through this year. I just don't care. It's not what I want it to be. Now, that doesn't mean it isn't what it should be. That doesn't mean it isn't serving the greater good and drawing the greater audience. I don't know the numbers. I don't care about those either. But it's not what it was, and maybe that's what Hurley's tapping into. Is there any chance that college football gets better if the NFL takes it over, like we saw in that uh, athletic story? No. The Super League. No. No. And, and Pittsburgh fans, University of Pittsburgh fans – they better hope that don't happen because guess what happens to Pitt then, Tim? They're in the Triple A League. Yeah, well, I don't know. They'll, they'll be in the league the NFL doesn't pay attention to. I talked about this on your show because it came out right before I was guest hosting for you one day while you were out, and I don't know if we got through the entire nooks and crannies of the whole league, and I don't want to dive down every rabbit hole about it, but basically they're saying 80 teams, 70 of which would be set, and then you have like 10 leagues that go up and down with relegation. 
I don't know that pitch in the top. Ten, ten teams, you mean? Ten teams. Yeah, ten teams go up and down. So, in other words, the seventy teams that are set couldn't be relegated, no matter how bad they are. Right. Yes. Okay. Then, then, then the system makes no sense. You can't have a pyramid with an anchor at one end. That makes yeah. no sense. No, it has I, to be where it has to be where teams go up and down, no matter who they are. Yeah, it's basically another way of creating conferences, is what it I, is. I'll give you an example, Tim. What if the bottom ten get relegated? Okay, and Pitt is one of the teams eligible for relegation, and they go six and four, and uh, Alabama in a bad year goes four and six, but Pitt goes down and Alabama stays up. Makes no sense. Okay, you can't have a pyramid where either end is anchored. Yeah, I I think it's another way, basically, of finagling the SEC and the Big Ten into power. It's just going to be redistributed differently. It's and another really, way of saying they don't understand that system. You're talking about the soccer relegation system. Right, 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 the pyramid. If, if, yeah. if, if, if you have the entire college football world in the pyramid, then it makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. But if you have teams that can't go down, it makes no sense whatsoever. It defeats the whole purpose of the pyramid where every single team, in theory, in the long haul, has a shot to win the national championship or be the worst team in the country. And, Mark, this just kind of goes back to all the celebration over toppling the NCAA with NIL and all that. And I get it. People thought it was a monolithic empire that was ruling with an iron fist. So, well, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. You're going to go from the NCAA to the NFL. This is always what it was going to be. Somebody eventually has to be in charge. There has to be an entity that is in charge. And no one's going to like who's in charge, whether it's the NFL or the NCAA. Well, college football's too big to fail. And we're finding it out because it's run absolutely incompetently. For years, it's been the only major league, big-time sport rather, big-time sport, where you didn't know what you had to do to win the championship at the beginning of the season. Where going undefeated might not be good enough to get a shot at it, and in fact, hasn't been on several occasions. Uh, let's get to some comments here. And that's start- one, thing, one, one thing that's amazing, and it shows how stupid our country is. We live in, a, in an America where the IQ is declining. It's plummeting. It has to be. I'd love to see the figures on that. And being a super genius, of course, I'm going to be condescending about stuff like that, as in all of you out there are stupid. But but it amazes me how badly some things are in sports and people will argue for still how great they are. I've seen the the talking heads, and, you know, when you get minor leaguers on TV, you take that risk, saying this is the greatest NHL season ever. It is so far from that, it's incredible. Yeah, well, as is proven by who's trying to get in at the bottom from the Eastern Conference. I mean, do we need any more proof than that? That's where sports journalism went bad, Tim. When people stopped pointing out when something was bad and, in fact, went the opposite direction and outright lied. Richard says Jari might be the more skilled goaltender, but Nedeljkovic just has that innate ability to make the big save at the right time. No, um, no, no right, right now that's true. Yeah, uh, like, for instance, the save at the end of the game against Tampa, and he made a good move by stopping the puck and then pushing it away and not forcing for a cover. But, you know, there's also something to be said for making the right save at the right time so it doesn't get to 4-4 four to four before Bunting scores the goal. I thought he just looked tired in, in the third period. That's why I would start Jari tonight. That's no knock on Ned. But goalie's not that kind of position anymore. Uh, the pace is so frantic, and the games are packed so tightly together. Even in the playoffs, I, I think the era of playing the same goalie every game is kind of de rigueur. Look at, look at Vegas last year with four goalies in the playoffs. Uh, Ron says, please keep Harkins with the baby pens. And then in talking about the fighting in hockey, Remke is a clown show. Well, I, I hate the Remke, the Remke thing. And, you know, we have Chris Simon killing himself, an ex force with CTE. We all say how terrible that is. And then the aforementioned minor leaguers are glamorizing Remke starting the line brawl in the Devils Rangers game. Yes, excuse me. I read you know, that. It's not like, the old, you know, people talk about the old days. In the old days, I mean, Dave Schultz was an unconscionable goon for the Flyers in the 70s. He scored 20 goals a couple times. Bob Prober could play. Ty Domi could play. But, but we, we reached the point, and now there's less of them because there's less goons, period, thank God. 
But we reached the point where the goon just can't play at all, as in Rempe. Going back to your point, no one takes the time or is willing to say when something's bad anymore. Um, Look at the fighting and hockey thing. All of a sudden, we're glorifying fighting and hockey because no one wants to take a negative opinion since we see all these videos and tweets going around the internet about how fun it is that Rempe's a star in New York City. Yeah, if he wasn't in New York City, nobody would give a damn. It, it, it It's like the earthquake in New York City, Tim. I, I forget. I think I think Randy Bauman tweeted this. Uh, now that New York's had an earthquake, it'll be the only earthquake ever. <laughs> and, do you remember when they had – remember when New York had the hurricane and they had the uh, the concert for Hurricane Relief? Yes, yes. Okay, and the Stones performed on it? Yes. And Mick Jagger said – we're glad we can help out. Maybe the next time it rains in London, you can bring an umbrella. <laughs> it, it, you know, it just if it's in New York, it gets blown way out of proportion. Frank says, "What happens when Graves is healthy?" Good question. You know, I, I thought about this too. I talked about it on the podcast with Seth Rorba on Sunday. Um, is there a direct correlation as to why things have been better while he's been out? Has there been a sort of a, an addition by subtraction there on the blue line? Well, POJ played bad all season and about six weeks ago started playing good. So I'm not sure there's, you know, a correlation that with Graves being not. Pete, Pete uh, Pedersen's been good all year. Uh, who's the who's the other defenseman there now? Uh, St. Ivany. No, he's on the right side. Who's on the left side? Uh, Pedersen. POJ. Uh, POJ. Who it says a lot that we can't remember. Yeah. Um, why? Who are you get? You trying to figure out? I'm googling it, Tim. I'm not. I'm not leaving this to imagination. We've we've sounded dumb enough, long enough. Um, uh, oh, Ryan Shea lately. Oh, Shea. That's right. Yeah, Shea. Right. Because yeah. Ludwig's been hurt. So, uh, that's a good question. Would, would I leave uh Ryan Shea in there in place of Ryan Graves? I probably would right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about not trying to screw around with things and mess things up in goal. Why does it have to be different on the blue line? I think Graves will be a lot better next year, though. Uh, that's happened a lot with the defensemen that we've seen here in Pittsburgh. I mean, like Paul Martin, Sergey Gonchar, we tend to forget those guys had lousy first years in Pittsburgh, too. Not, I'm yeah. not saying that those guys are necessarily going to uh, – that they're the same player as Graves, but I do think it will get better. Uh, last thing, Mark, you've got the – Eclipse during the middle of your show. Do you expect chaos and do you expect the apocalypse somewhere after the first hour of the program today? I'm certainly hoping for it. I like, you know what movie I watched? I watched Oppenheimer. Oh, did you? What did you think? I got to make a note on that for uh, for my show, Discuss Oppenheimer. You know what show uh, I'm watching right now is Manhunt, which is about the search for John Wilkes Booth on Apple TV. It is I think not- caught him beside him. It is so not the care. same thing as the app, Mark. The app Manhunt and the TV show Manhunt are entirely different. Just for people, if you Google Manhunt, make sure you put in comma television show because you might go to a place that you don't want to go with Ooh. your computer. Or, or maybe you do. Okay. Um, I, I, uh, I, I, I hope Tom McMillan gets to catch John Wilkes Booth. That would be the, the realization <laughs> of, a, of a lifelong goal. Uh, no, uh, Oppenheimer was, was real good. Uh, real good. I I was kind of disconcerted to know that that they there was a slim possibility that once the first nuclear weapon ignited, it would ignite the atmosphere and blow up the world. Yes, they weren't one hundred percent sure that wasn't going to happen. Right, which could be like, the case with the apocalypse today with the eclipse. That's what we're like. Oppen- the guy playing Oppenheimer said, "Well, the chance of that is almost zero. And Matt Damon's <laughs> this this army currently goes. Well, I prefer it would be zero. Yeah, I, I do remember that scene. That was one of the better scenes in the movie. But yeah, I, I liked it. I liked Oppenheimer. All right. Um, well, good luck during the eclipse today, Mark. If nothing else, you saw Liverpool win twice before you leave this morning. Right, right. They got a draw yesterday. Uh, made some bad mistakes, but uh, tied for first on points, second on goal differential, seven games for each of the three teams uh, battling. Uh, right now, it's Liverpool and Arsenal at 71 points. Manchester City at 70 points, so there's still everything to play for. Somebody wanted more soccer talk before we go in the comment section. You got it. Uh, that will do it for Madden Benz Unfiltered, brought to you by Rush to Crush Cancer. More than a ride, it's a mission. 
Join us May 19th for the Rush to Crush Cancer bike ride. To register, go to rushtocrushcancer.org and help us in the fight against cancer. Join the ride.